Excellent. So um, welcome, everyone. I think in the interest of time, we'll, uh, we'll get started here. Um, today is a very special day, as you all know. It's not just winter Armageddon in Halifax. <laughs> and I, I want you to, oh my god, I still have my Leon. Um, <laughs> I want you to, to, I really want to appreciate all you winter warriors who wear red for women. Put that in your mouth and try to say it again, right? For coming in and for sharing your, your noon hour with us in, um, in recognition of this special time. Um, I'm Sharon Mulvey. I am a cardiologist here at the QE2, and uh, I'm the director, co-director of the Women's Heart Clinic. My other co-director, Helen Bishop, was going to bring in her beautiful little few-month-old baby, Ella, all dressed in red, but with the weather and all, I think she decided that it would be better to um, stay put in their cozy hibernation spot. So um, she has um, uh, ordered in the coffee for us, so we thank Helen very much for the coffee today. Um, I uh, also want to thank everyone who helped with the organization. We had a great planning committee that pulled this together. And the booze outside, you've met all of the individuals that are involved there. And uh, I just can't thank everyone enough. And I'd like to give a particular shout out to Debbie Hutchings, who actually enabled us to have this location today, because we displaced the Department of Medicine <laughs> monthly meeting. Yes. <laughs> So that's a big thank you, too, to Dr. Christine Short, who approved that, and uh, Dr. Ada Karashi, who is with us from cardiology, who also agreed to that. So I do, um, I do thank you. I would like to um, introduce our uh, colleague, um, Dr. Uh, Ms. Vicki Sullivan. Uh, Vicki is the executive director of the uh, Central Zone, and she will be saying a few words. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, many of you I know, um, but uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you very much for having me today. Um, and it's an absolute honor to speak at this first ever Wear, Wear Red Canada Day, an event that has been na the first time it's national this year. After Dr. Sharon uh, Mulvey, uh, one of our QE2 cardiologists, as we know, um, spearheaded this initiative last year. And uh, many of you may have seen the photo with people on the steps going down from the second floor last year and people in red. So um, really nice to see it go national this year. Um, it's wonderful to see so many people here today in spite of the weather, um, all wearing red. Um, and it's simply important for us to remember that we have to work together to actually raise awareness about women's heart health. The reality is that heart disease isn't just a man's disease. Most people don't realize that heart disease is actually the number one killer of women worldwide, with heart attacks going unrecognized for many women, and about half the time, because our signs and symptoms do differ from those of men. In fact, much of, a, of what we know about the diagnosis and treatment of heart disease is based on research in men. But we're learning that women's heart experience and reaction to heart disease differ in many different ways. Sadly, women are about 50% more likely than women to die within the first year following a heart attack. Yet women are underdiagnosed, undertreated, and understudied when it comes to cardiovascular disease. That's why wearing red today, raising awareness, is so vital to educating women on how they can improve their heart health. Among arming women with the latest information, the risk factors, symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment unique to them will provide them with the tools they need to lead their healthiest, happiest lives. Thank you again for having me. Also, a very special thank you to the brave women who have shared their personal stories and to the local health care professionals who are the leaders in the Wear Red Canada campaign. Find you, thank you all for wearing red because um, it really does matter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vicki. And I feel that um, you've just concisely said everything that we're going to chat about a little bit more in detail um, in the next few minutes. So um, it is my pleasure to just introduce a little bit about the Wear Red um, 
program uh, and day that we're sharing together here. And as Vicki reminded us last year, here's that picture. We were all on the stairway. And we hope that um, we'll be done in time that most of you can do this again with us. So we're planning to get done by 10 to 1 so that we can all head out to the stairs. Please don't run away unless you really have to. And then we'll take a picture. I was kind of hoping we could fill both sides of the stairs, but I think the winter got in the way there. So, um, But it's great to see you and to see that we've been able to, at that actually event, we kind of were a coming out party for our Women's Heart Health Clinic. And we've seen um, over about 100 women now in the Women's Heart Health Clinic since it has been established. And uh, Helen and I have um, been able, I think, to... Uh, to respond to some of the needs uh, that were unmet previously for our uh, women uh, that were living with heart disease uh, or uh, at risk for heart disease. Um, last year, you might remember too, at this time, it's always Heart Month in February, and Heart and Stroke released the Heart Month, which was focused on women and heart disease. And then later in June, the Stroke Report was focused on stroke and women. And we're very fortunate to have Dr. Sherry Hugh, who will be with us today to address the stroke issues as well. Um, here's the report that Vicki alluded to and the unders. I, I love this um, expression. We call it the five unders. And the problem is that it is because it is the exact opposite of the over. Women are over dying and they are under aware, under diagnosed, under treated, under researched and under supported. And I forgot to reach out to our regional um, audience as well. Thank you so much for joining us. We are actually connected through the province today, uh, courtesy of the cardiovascular division to open the lines that we normally have for cardiovascular grand rounds. So hello everybody across the Maritimes. Thank you for joining us today in this special day of recognition. I think we're aware that women are uh, five times more likely to die from heart disease than breast cancer, although most of us think about pink ribbons. Um, hopefully we'll be thinking more about the red color as well for representation of heart disease in women. It's unfortunate that women are less likely than men to get standard heart attack testing. Still, in this era, we have just looked at data and the new report that has come out from Heart and Stroke uh, just this month uh, confirms that women are less likely to get tested and they're less likely to get standard treatments that we use in men. Now sometimes clinically things are a little bit different for women and we'll talk about that. So the treatments might differ a little bit, but in general women are still undertreated. But yet women are more likely to die in hospital, they have higher in hospital mortality, and also in the year following a heart attack. Unfortunately, women are less likely to participate in cardiac rehab. Now, I spoke with Nick Giacomantonio about our own program, and we have our great colleagues here, uh, Wanda Firth and Peggy Hulin from the cardiovascular rehab area. And we're pretty good in the metro area about getting women into uh, cardiac rehab because it's a, an order it automatically happens. But this unfortunately doesn't extend to our more rural women in Nova Scotia, of which more than half is our population. So it's also important that we encourage women to get into cardiac rehab programs and to establish programs and to follow things through also with peer support opportunities. And we'll hear a little more about that from our women with lived experience today. Because women do get more benefit from cardiac rehab, actually, than men do. That has been shown. And it's the same, I think, for stroke rehab as well. Why? Why? Why is this happening that women are underserved? Well, historically, we know that research has focused on men. Two-thirds of cardiovascular research is included really only men. We're out to change this, hopefully. We need sex-specific information to be able to serve our women uh, better. And so Heart and Stroke has made some fantastic efforts in this direction. Uh, the campaign, it's time, hashtag time to see red, was launched last spring and then brings us to where we are. Um, with the Wear Red Canada Day. Um, the, uh, the Canadian Women's Heart Health Summit was established in 2016. I mentioned this last year, I think, in this program. And uh, we met again in 2018, and we actually came together across the country and established for the first time a volunteer group of individuals who are passionate about improving cardiovascular outcomes for women and we called ourselves the Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance. This is a voluntary group that is comprised of professionals in the healthcare area, as well as women and men with lived experience. 
And we have four working groups, Knowledge Translation and Mobilization. I chair that group. Advocacy, um, my colleague Tara Sedlak in Vancouver chairs that group. Education and Training is chaired by Beth Abramson in Toronto. And Health Systems Policy by Colleen Norris, also uh, in Alberta, actually. And we are across the country celebrating Wear Red Canada Day today as a direct result of the first timeline goal that was put on the calendar for the advocacy group to establish a date where we could come across the country together in this awareness. And so this is why we're here together today. And I really, it was sort of a dream that this could happen last year when we talked about it, but we were the nidus for it. We here in Halifax started this. So you all should be very proud of yourselves and thank you very much. And we hope that you're gonna be able to come uh, again next year, and we'll keep on doing this every year, because we still have to get the message out. Heart disease is the number one killer of, men, of women, cardiovascular disease together, heart and stroke, but it is even more true that just heart disease alone is the major killer, premature killer, of women. That means women less than 55. And this is more impactful than all cancers combined. We know that symptoms can be different, and we have to understand that although women usually present with some type of chest discomfort in the throes of a major heart attack, maybe about a third don't have any chest symptoms. And the majority of women actually have other symptoms, and it could be shortness of breath, profound fatigue, sweating, nausea, et cetera. So we have to think outside the box as healthcare providers when we see that woman in front of us in the emergency room and expand our differential. We need to listen to her carefully, and we need to encourage our women to tell their stories. And you're going to hear some amazing stories yet today. Heart disease is preventable, and Knowing your numbers, we talk about that. There are four specific numbers that I would like everyone to know and to share with your patients how important they are. To know what your weight is and what your body mass index is and also that waist circumference measurement because that's where the bad fat sits and that's very predictive. We need to know our blood pressure, we need to know cholesterol, and we need to know our blood sugar. And then we have to have three healthy, lifestyle habits, and that is to eat well and sensibly and a heart-healthy style of diet, lots of fruits and veggies, lots of fiber, lean sources of protein, and um, good fats, not bad ones. And we also need to move more, just move more, anything more than we're doing already for most of us, but goal, 30 minutes of moderate activity on most days of the week, and not to smoke. If we do, then we need to encourage uh, those that, uh, around us to, to quit and to quit ourselves. So stress also is an important thing that we need to learn how to manage, and we're working more on that. It's very true that 90% of Canadian women and men have at least one modifiable risk factor. Your family history obviously isn't modifiable. If you have a positive family history of premature cardiac disease, then it's ever so much more important that you do go ahead and modify your modifiable risk factors, the ones we've just discussed, to be optimized. The problem is, is that when a woman goes to see a doctor, most often, the doctor doesn't even discuss anything about cardiovascular prevention. Now, this is changing slightly, but surveys were done within the past five, 10 years, only 25% of doctors discussed heart disease risk factor modifications with their female patients. And on the flip side, what do our Canadian women think? Do they even think that they're at risk for heart disease? Unfortunately not. And particularly our young women, and it's those women that really, really need to have the education because it's when we can make a difference. Heart disease is preventable, and we can make a difference by the habits we set early on. And it's really unfortunate that young women really don't believe that heart disease can be different from men when asked in a survey by Heart and Stroke, and that a large majority eat unhealthy foods frequently during the week. And our young women are really stressed out. I mean, all of us are trying to balance too many things, but really stressed out, and this can certainly be a trigger. And it's even more magnified in our women of color, our Canadian women of color, our Indigenous women, our African Canadian women. They are far more at risk. What about pregnancy, unique risk factors? 
Yeah. Is it a stress test? Well, I wouldn't encourage that we do this. But it's good to be active when you're pregnant. But indeed, we know that women that develop high blood pressure, preeclampsia, toxemia, or gestational diabetes, those women are more at risk to develop cardiovascular disease, both heart attacks and stroke down the road. And similarly, women that develop breast cancer and are treated with chemotherapy, radiation therapy, they're at risk. Their hearts are at risk. More common in women are autoimmune disorders and lupus in particular, rheumatoid arthritis, because of the chronic inflammatory state, inflammation sets up atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries. And so their heart and stroke risk is also increased. And at the other end of the spectrum from pregnancy, we kind of get all the hormones taken away. And those hormones, when there are our own endogenous or native hormones, are good for our hearts as women. They protect the heart. They Estrogen causes vasodilatation. And so we know that the incidence of heart disease increases as women age. And if there's early loss of hormones because of reproductive issues, ovarian failure, polycystic ovary syndrome, then women are more at risk for heart disease as well. So this is a whole topic in itself, but it's important to recognize that we don't advise hormone therapy for the treatment or for the prevention of heart disease, but we know our own natural hormones are good. But if we have early menopause, that's when you need to start, start talking to your doctor. That means less than 40 years of age because you need to have your heart protected. Okay, different types of heart attack in the last minute. Unfortunately, women are more complicated than men. We have more buttons going on here sometimes. And I think if the, I'm glad to see we have some men in the audience, and you probably would agree. Because women can have different types of heart attacks. And one thing is called spontaneous coronary artery dissection, where instead of a buildup of the plaque and the blockage in the artery, the blockage in the artery is caused by a tear, a spontaneous tear in the artery. Now, there's a lot of things we have to learn about this disorder, but the thing is, is that women 90% of the patients with SCAD are women, and they're younger women. Mean age is in the early 40s. And we're going to have someone tell us very specifically about that in just a moment. I do have some brochures out on the table about SCAD and about small vessel disease, which is more common in women. Also, you may have heard of broken heart syndrome. At the other end of the spectrum, menopausal, postmenopausal women, 90% of the patients with broken heart syndrome are women that are postmenopausal. So things are different for women in how we get heart attacks. We still can get the same kind as men get, but we get other ones that are different. And as healthcare providers, we have to understand that and to be able to think about it because we treat things differently depending on what the exact thing is that's causing the heart attack. And this is very important. So as I mentioned, this is a tear and mostly women. I'd like to leave you with this thought. If you think that you are having something that is not right with your body, then get yourself to the emergency room and call 911. Don't drive yourself, please, or have your neighbor drive you. And make sure that even if the, there's weird symptoms, but you know that often it's described as impending doom, make sure that you even, if you don't even have chest pain, just kind of say chest pain and say, I think I might be having a heart attack, because then you'll get the two tests that you need to have the blood test and the electrocardiogram, and don't get stopped at the gate. That's a phrase that we hear a lot from our women. They get stopped at the gate in the emergency room because nobody believes them, because they look too healthy to have a heart attack. So know your numbers, make good lifestyle choices. You can prevent heart disease, but then there are some other weird kind of heart diseases that we have to think about that we can still get, even though we're doing everything right. This is a great sheet that has come out from Heart and Stroke on how to prepare yourself for your doctor's appointment, to go in there, be organized, and be able to get the information that you need so you don't walk out of there feeling like you weren't heard or that you didn't get your message across. This is the current report, and I'm so glad to have Cheryl McKenzie with us here today. And Cheryl has really pulled this together from the heart, brain, and disease, uh, cognitive disease uh, perspectives that we know now the vascular system connects our brains and our hearts, and that if we keep one healthy, we keep the other healthy, and that we must do this and recognize that we have to be advocates for our own bodies and our own health, in particular, our own cardiovascular health. So there are challenges and there are opportunities, and I think that being having an event, being here with you today, and you all coming here today 
Show us your commitment to living a heart-healthy lifestyle and sharing that with your friends, your neighbors, your patients, and your families. And I really want to applaud you and thank you all for being here with us. So without further ado... to introduce our next speaker, who is a cover girl, okay? You see this? Katherine, this is yesterday's star, whoops, upside down here, star, <laughs> star Metro Halifax. These are some extra copies I found in the hotel lobby that I'm giving to Katherine to give to her mom and her sister. <laughs> did, I, did I tell you why I saw one yesterday at the at Italian market, and I saw it, and I like this, and I put it in my bag, and I left. <laughs> Because I did not want anybody to see it while I was there. Catherine has confided. Catherine Cook is our woman with lived experience who will share her story today. Mm -hmm. And Catherine has confided in me <laughs> that she is a very private person. Mm -hmm. And so I just continue to admire her courage in sharing her story with us. And today she brought her family as well because... They have a four-wheel drive. Their husband plowed through the snow to bring them, and they have her daughter was on a snow day. So um, we welcome Patrick and her family, and we're Thank you. very excited for you to share your story with us. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. I know. Okay. Okay, so I'm Catherine. Three and a half years ago, I had a scad heart attack. Um, I was in a workout class. I I was just turned 40 years old. I was 123 pounds at most. I just finished boot camp for a month. I was super healthy. I'm ridiculous about food. Ask my family. They hate it. Um, largely vegan in a lot of ways, although I do eat meat. And, and I, I'm not vegan because of the the process behind it. It's I, I don't mind animal product. It's just that for me, legumes, nuts, that type of thing. I'm very careful about what I eat, and I'm very careful with my family as well. They hate that they don't have processed foods. There's no packaged cookies that drive some nuts. So uh, it was really unusual, and I, I'd had, you know, I was in a workout class when it happened. Actually, I was in a ballet bar class, and as most women do, I was not expecting it. I, I was 40. There was no chance I was going to have a heart attack. I take good care of myself for a reason. I didn't want anything to happen. So I kept working out. I kept going for 20 minutes. I kept working through it. You know, we do one set, and then we get to the end, and I kind of stop and go, ooh, it feels better. I'm all right. And I go to the next one. So I did that four times. And then, you know, I had pain in my shoulder. And the, the pain was actually just, like, really bad heartburn, but it was in a wrong spot. It was down low, and it felt strange. My, my husband had our kids at a birthday party, so I thought, perfect. Nobody's home. Nobody will know I'm missing. I'm going to go to the hospital. So I naturally drove myself. I got down there, they at triage, they were wonderful, it, it wasn't an issue, I, I wasn't presenting in, in a terrified manner or anything, I told them what I thought could be happening, I said I had chest pain and a bad shoulder and I wasn't sure, maybe it was heart issue, so they did an ECG right away, didn't show anything, they said there was a tiny blip at the end, but they weren't concerned about it, so I went and sat in the waiting room for four hours. So I stayed there, and actually around about hour three, I thought to myself, you know, it's, it's getting on for time. It's 8 o'clock at night. Everybody at home is now panicking. My phone's almost dead. Nobody knows what's going on. And so I finally just, I was going to leave. And it, the nurse came out finally and said, all right, come on back. And they did the blood work. So they came out and told me I was just about ready to go home. And um, suddenly somebody came running out. And they said, come with me. You need to take this. They gave me aspirin. They gave me a gown. They gave me nitro. They said, you're having a heart attack. My troponin levels were way elevated, and things weren't right. So that's it. I stayed for five days, moved in. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> it was days, really. It was still a while before I really knew what happened. So there's, first of all, you know, with SCAD, even at the time, this is three and a half years ago, so there wasn't a whole lot of knowledge about it. And, I mean, they were tossing this term around, but I'd never heard of it. And, you know, they were still kind of talking about pericarditis. So even ultrasounds, it, was, it wasn't until I had the, uh, the, what do you call that? The, that one, yes, the dye test, the angiogram. The angiogram showed it on Wednesday. So I'd been in on Sunday. I'd been there for four days, basically, by the time I knew what was going on. And then I was, I waitless, I waited. I was, you know, let out of the hospital on Friday. And it was August. So it wasn't until December when I finally met Dr. Horn. So... That's, you know, that's the long shot. That's the experience that I had. It was one of terrifying news. 
there was no information. There was nothing. Nobody could really tell me what was going on. And all I had was Dr. Google when I left. There were no brochures. I, I left with a ton of brochures, but they were about angiograms. They were about a heart-healthy diet. They were about losing weight, not smoking. I did none of those. I was, you know, the body is my temple kind of person. So it made no sense for me. This was, I was so angry and so frustrated that my body had let me down. So, you know, I think that kind of brings me into the three things I wish I'd known as a woman with heart disease. I wish I had known that no matter how careful I was with my diet and how careful I was with my lifestyle, it doesn't make me immune. I still can have those things happen to me. I wish I'd known what the symptoms were. I had a general idea. I knew my shoulder could be something, but I was kind of thinking it was my rotator cuff. I had trouble with that anyway. I wasn't too concerned. But I wish that I'd known more, and I wish that I'd also been a better self-advocate. You know, the doctors were great, and I'm not, I don't, there's, there's no, I, I don't mean to insult anyone that I sat for four hours. I do not look like a heart attack victim. I was five foot six, 123 pounds. I was not in any shape. I probably looked like an anxiety attack, right? So I wish I'd been a better self-advocate. But, you know, in the end, now I can advocate for others, hopefully, and help get this word out. So what I'd like to see change, uh, that was one thing Dr. Mulvey asked, what would I like to see change? I think for the most, one of the most important things is there needs to be something in place for women when they leave the hospital. So more information about women's hearts and, and you know, what can happen to us that's different from men. But SCAD in particular is, is very specific in our limitations. So all I was told was don't shovel any snow. It was August. That wasn't an issue then. <laughs> and take your medication and just take it easy for the next little while. No, no, nothing more than walking. And just, you know, anything that elevated my heart rate, I had to be careful of. By the time I saw um, Dr. Horn in December, I was a basket case. I had been terrified. I labeled my kids' presence because I kept thinking. When I went to bed every night, I thought I would be dead when I the next morning. I didn't think I would wake up. My husband traveled. I was at home alone with three kids. My youngest was five, and I was terrified. So three months of that, I don't know if that, at this time, I, I think that we can do something about that. So I know a lot of this comes from, you know, a lot of this is always going to be about money, but there's also people like me, and, and there's a group of us. We now have a SCAD support group. Um, it's mostly on Facebook, but we reach out to each other. We have coffee dates, and all of most of these women, I can't say all, but most of these women want to give back and want to help and want to be able to go in and say to somebody that's having scads, you're going to make it. You're going to get up tomorrow morning. You'll be okay. Just get through this. You know, you, that first year is really tricky. That the, all those first anniversaries are difficult. But if you can just, you know, take a breath, give it a minute, try to get through it, and we're here for each other. So. What I'd like to see is, you know, more brochures in the hospital, something that can explain what SCAD is, more outreach, and then having groups like ours get a little more training, get some help so that we can go in and help people. I would gladly um, go into Emerge or go in, not Emerge, go into the CCU if people have questions or be available afterwards. I've given my phone number to brand new SCAD patients and said, call me. It's okay. We can talk about it, right? Just to have somebody else who's already been there is, is really huge. So... I think that's it. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Oh, oh and Catherine, this is another real gift. <laughs> and Catherine is obviously a gift to us, isn't she? Thank you so much for sharing your story, Catherine. I, I just, it, that is so powerful to understand that and to see where you're coming from. And, uh, I mean, when we're on one side of the, the table, the bed, the desk, whatever, it looks different from our perspective there. And to put ourselves in the shoes of our patients is very, very important. And being able to give your story is huge because that helps us be able to understand and see. And I really appreciate you enumerating the needs because I think we can do something about it. And we are so glad to have you as our advocate and ally in working together. So thank you again, Catherine. That's great. So I'd like to turn it over now to uh, Dr. Uh, Sherry Hu, who will um, review about the stroke aspects of the sex-specific unique stroke aspects of uh, stroke in women. Sherry. Sherry is a neurologist 
are you actually done your, no, you're in your last year, right? <laughs> but she and I have known each other, actually, <laughs> as a patient with lived, woman with lived experience in the neurology world <laughs> with my attending here. So um, we, we had a, a very um, a special kind of um, opportunity to meet before, yes. before we were met professionally as colleagues. So um, I actually had a, acute vestibular neuritis, and I was on the neurology service a year and a half ago, and Sherry was my resident. That's true. <laughs> and she did a great job. So I really uh, am very, very happy that we can come full circle and work together and, and help other women as well. So please, thank you, Sherry. Thank you. That was a, a lovely introduction. Um, so before I start, I actually would like to first thank Dr. Mulvey for being the person that inspired the this very important event across Canada uh, last year. Um, and uh, all of our uh, women in this room and uh, Catherine, thank you so much for that uh, very great talk. Um, so some of my information is based on the uh, uh, heart and stroke reports from 2018 and this newer one from 2019, which highlights the heart-brain-mind connection. So um, the latest messaging is basically about uh, the importance of brain, mind, and how strokes really affect the generator of our thoughts, of our emotions, of our feelings, of who we know and think that we are, and how we come to interpret the world. So um, protecting that brain and that center um, is what I'm here to talk about with you today. So as many of you know, um, just like heart attacks, um, and uh, you'll see lots of overlap between the conversation that we're having right now and what Dr. Mulvey just talked to you about. Strokes can also happen to anyone at any age and can vary in severity as well as how it presents. Yet, again, strokes affect men and women a little differently. Women are at higher risk during several key stages of their lives. So um, on the picture to the left there, women have higher risks during pregnancy and also during the time when they go through a biological adaptation um, of menopause, their stroke risks start to rise again. And as we know, um, women are now uh, living until their later 80s and elderly women are particularly susceptible to the effect of strokes. So we know from uh, uh, the stats that approximately half of all the strokes that occur in Canada occur to women. But unfortunately, women have worse outcomes than men. So many women, after a stroke, are less likely to be able to go home. And we know that if we look at all the proportion of people that die from strokes, a third more women die than men do. So over the next few slides, I'm going to talk to you about things that we could do to try to change these stats. So other than just medical reason, I think one of the factors that we have to consider is that women play many different roles at home, at work, and in our communities. Women are often the caregivers of their children and of their elderly parents, and women are certainly uh, doing more unpaid work and service in terms of chores, shopping, and caregiving than uh, men do at this current juncture in our society. That may change. Um, so. Because we're so involved in these roles, oftentimes women's health become deprioritized. We don't think about our own illnesses um, and our own health because our kids are more important. And this has negative ramifications. So for example, young women take the longest median hours to present to the emergency room after having a stroke, about nine hours. And 
the acute treatments that we give people have to happen within four and a half hours. So you can see how this would negatively impact outcomes for young women after they've had a stroke. So another aspect, which Dr. Malvea touched on, is that a lot of our research is done in men. Women are uh, underrepresented in stroke research, particularly the elderly female population, who we know has the greatest burden. Other groups of women who are particularly at risk involves uh, our South Asian women, our African American women, and of course our Indigenous women, who not only face difficulties um, in having research data, but also in accessing healthcare uh, to get the treatments that they need and also the rehabilitation programs in order for them to recover. And in research, we're just beginning to highlight the differences between men and women's brain health. And so it's a really great time for us to collectively leverage our voices to advocate to female patients, to healthcare providers, administrators, researchers, and even policymakers to publish more studies and to include more women in these studies so that we could know if there's things that we should be doing differently. So this slide should look fairly uh, similar to Dr. Mulvey's slide, but repetition never hurts. Um, so prevention is critical. We know that 90% uh, of people in Canada have at least one risk factor. And unfortunately, 70% of women don't know of any stroke risk factors. So all of you here will leave the room today knowing much more than... Uh, the surveyed population. Um, again, to reiterate the prior conversation, maintaining a healthy lifestyle is important. Remaining active, eating a balanced diet, everything in moderation. You can still have your Valentine's Day chocolate. And uh, maintaining a healthy weight and avoiding smoking. So those are all things that you could go home today and start thinking about how you might incorporate these changes into your life going forward. Some other health factors are a little bit more difficult for you to manage at home tonight. So see your doctor and ask about your blood pressure and whether or not you've had your diabetes checked and what your cholesterol is like. Because uh, we know that uh, hypertension is one of the greatest risk factors for stroke and heart attacks, but patients who have high blood pressure often don't feel any different than any of you in the room. So unless you check, it's hard for you to know. And the thing that is a bit unique um, than heart attacks is that heart disease, such as uh, arrhythmia, such as atrial fibrillation, can actually predispose you to having strokes. So if you've had some sort of heart problem in the past, keep stroke uh, on your mind so that uh, you can always be aware. So I'm going to leave you with signs of a stroke. This is, of course, not an exhaustive list, but uh, um, we know that uh, only about 36% of women are able to name all of these signs. And, uh, sorry, 36% uh, of women don't know any of these signs, and only 8% of women know all three. So I will teach it to you right now. So the acronym is FAST. So uh, what you're looking for is, is my face or is my partner's face drooping? And it would be drooping on one side of the face, typically. The A is arms. So you bring the arms up, and is one of the arms weak? and also drooping. The S is for speech. Is the speech slurred, like when you're at a dentist, or jumbled and the words don't really make any sense? And if you have any of these three signs, the most imperative thing is to call 911 right away. Because as we talked about earlier, the um, acute treatments that we can give to try to fix a stroke can only occur in the first four and a half hours. Um, so it's important to call 911, 
take the ambulance, go into the hospital and advocate for yourself and say, I've got these things. I've had a stroke. Help me. So I'm going to end on the same quote from uh, this year's Heart and Stroke newsletter. And I'd like to uh, introduce to you all Cheryl McKenzie. She's um, our woman with uh, stroke lived experiences. And we have the great pleasure of having her here today to share a few words about what it was like to have had a stroke. And thank you so much for coming. It's a bit different this year because last year my topic was lived experience with heart attack. So I've had both. I started out when I was 22. I had a TIA as it was diagnosed, and they diagnosed it incorrectly. It was side effects of a migraine. They kept me in the hospital for seven days and sent me home. No medication, no follow-up, nothing. Flip forward 15 years later, 37. Second one. This time, my mother was with me in the uh, emergency room. All they kept asking, is she on drugs? I wasn't awake. I was unconscious for four hours, and I finally woke up. And I looked at my arm and said, what in the heck did they do to me? They actually took up my arm and they twisted it to see if they would get any pain response. Then they said, you're okay to go home. So I went and picked up my car where it was left and I drove my car home. Next morning, I went down to my doctor who had been my, who was my family doctor for 30 years, who's now retired. And he sent me to a cardiologist and a neurologist. And at that point, did some very simple tests. Put my feet together, which are not together right now, and put, closed my eyes and put my arms out. Well, guess what? I went, yee. And for me, it was like, that's twice. And nothing was done. It took my family doctor to send me to the tests. And I do credit him for sending me the tests all these years. And then of course, I didn't stop there. I took my heart attack when I was 48. However, I have a couple of pre uh, problems that would uh, help. I do have PCOS, which was not diagnosed as part of that. And I found out that when I was 21. So a year later, I take my first stroke. I have a family history. My father took his heart attack when he was 37. So there's been a lot of factors in my family and now my father has been diagnosed also with dementia, which is in, also in part of the heart and stroke report. And there's Alzheimer's on my mother's side. So, gee, I'm going to have a great life. <laughs> but you know what? I have learned so much in the past couple of years. My anniversary for my heart attack is coming up. It bothers me every year. I do still have, and you will still have it as well, on March 8th. I do not sleep well that night because I'm scared still to this day that I'm not going to wake up because I was told if I continued smoking, which I was at that time, I was 50% more likely to have a heart attack. And if I had lived alone, I wouldn't be here. So I have quit smoking. It's been 17 years now. And I have not had a drink since I was 37. Sometimes I wish I could have one. <laughs> but you learn to adjust. And to all the women out there, as I said in my quote, if you get a chance to go to cardiac rehab, please do so. I actually talked to Peggy. You know, where's Peggy sitting? Anyway, oh, there you are. I've already talked to Peggy, and I would like to go back for a refresher. <laughs> because I'm kind of pulling off the track. And yes, women do have a lot of stress, and I do because I have my father in a home as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you have a family member who is a woman, please get yourself checked. Don't wait till it's too late, because you may not be here the next day. Thank you very much.
You can't get off that quick. Oh, I thought I was okay. going to get off. Okay. I thought that was bad enough. Okay. All right. So thank you very much, Cheryl, as well, for sharing your story with us. It's a different story, but it's a story that we all need to know. And we absolutely appreciate your insights and your messages because it is very, very powerful and impactful. And now I'm going to also elicit your support in being able to do our drawing. Okay? Oh, yeah. All right? Okay. So with all that good hand-eye coordination that you have. All right. Excellent. So here we go. Drum roll. Everybody got their tickets out? Okay. You didn't put it in the box? No, they put mine in the box. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Shake, 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 shake. How do we get in this little tiny thing? I think we have to, the heart and stroke people, you know, like they do things very, very, ah, thank you, ladies. There is, there is a way to open this up. I've got it figured out now. Okay. All right. Catherine, will you All grab right. one for us, please? Can you read okay, that? it is 038728. 038728. Does anyone have it? Aww. Yes. All right. Come on down. <laughs> All right, and um, it's a mystery what's in these bags, but they could be anything from heart healthy books to heart and stroke bling to a gift certificate from the bicycle thief for a val and romantic Valentine's Day dinner. So, all right, Cheryl. Zero three eight seven eight three. Zero three eight seven eight three. Woo! Come on down. All right. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. And back to you, Catherine. Yes, please. Okay. Zero three eight seven five three. Zero three eight seven five three. So seven. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Nobody's going to believe that that wasn't fixed, yeah, though, right. Catherine. Okay, okay. Last year either. Yeah. All right. okay. Are you going out to dinner tonight or something? Yeah. I was like, oh. <laughs> All right. 038770. 770 on the end. 770? Seven, seven, All right. Come on down. <laughs> Excellent. Wow. Okay. All right. Next one. Okay. Zero three eight seven five four. Seven five four. Anybody have seven five four? Yes. Come on down. <laughs> we, we're getting our exercise at the same time here th today. All right, Cheryl. Zero three eight seven four zero seven four zero. Woo! All right. We have so many winners. Well, we're all winners because we're all here today, so we appreciate that. But it's great. Okay, Catherine. I'm gonna leave the Okay. Zero three eight seven eight two seven eight two seven eight two. Oh, did they have to go back to work? <laughs> 782? 782, yes! All right. Okay, Cheryl. 038727. 727, 727. Here we go. All right. Come on down. What is this interesting thing? <laughs> You can put all your heart healthy pictures in your new picture frame. All right. <laughs> okay. And. A bunch of t shirts and stuff too. Okay. If we wanted to get those out. Well, how do you want to do that? Well, we got it. Okay. Yeah, I'm to Lindsay's coordinating everything. Okay, well, let's. We have one last grand prize to do here. Okay, all right. I want Cheryl to reach up real. No, come on, I'm not careful. <laughs> 
There we go. Okay. Okay. Zero three eight seven six three. Seven six three. Seven six three. You are going to a heart healthy dinner. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So we, we have a few more items that um, Lindsay will get uh, organized and uh, will be um, maybe randomly. How are you doing this, Lindsay? Has so everybody still got two more minutes? Okay, we have a couple t-shirts. Okay, next year I think we should get our Wear Red Canada t-shirts. What do you think? We'll do that. Wear Red Canada, Halifax, and Nova Scotia, all around. Okay, so that's okay. All right, okay, here we go. One, two, three. I'm not very good at this, but woo! All right. Hey, how about on this side? Woo! Okay. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, everybody. We're red. We're red. We'll, we'll meet you out on the steps. Okay. One last, one last thing. We need to go out on the steps. Okay, for a picture. Thank you.